Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Porterfield, CEO of the Aspen Institute, and fantastic to see all of you and to have the chance to talk with my longtime friend, Wes Moore, about this great new book that he's written, which I have read and you have not. So <laughs> I've got something on you right now. But in another couple months, you're all going to read this book. I think they're all getting sent this book, in fact. Aren't That's right. They? So that's pretty cool. Um, I want to start with one question, and the only person that can't answer is Jeff Canada. Did anybody in this room know Wes Moore when he was 20 years old? <laughs> all right, so, so I have a second thing over all of you because we met when this young man was a student at Johns Hopkins University. It turns out Jeff met him when he was 12. Um, and so I've been able to uh, be friends with Wes and see his journey to leadership through a number of stages that have just been so inspiring to see. And this one really, uh, is exciting me, seeing you leading uh, Robin Hood and seeing you continuing to use your voice to call us out uh, to help drive change that will promote a free, just, and equitable society. Yeah. So, whew, way Thank to go. You. And can, actually, yeah. can I say one thing? So, so yeah. how I got a chance to meet uh, Professor Porterfield was he was at Georgetown, and, uh, and another mentor of mine was a gentleman named Kirk Schmoke, who was the uh, former mayor of Baltimore. And uh, he was talking to me about, I just finished junior college, community college, transferred to Johns Hopkins, he knew how I was doing academically, and he said, um, you should apply for this thing called the Rhodes Scholarship. And, uh, and I was like, okay. And he's like, uh, and he said, but you know, as you're working on your essay, I want you to send it to my friend, Dan Porterville. And like, he's busy, he's like professor at Georgetown. So I'm like, okay, would you mind taking a look at my essay? And he sends this thing back, and it has markups all over it. <laughs> this paragraph doesn't make sense, da 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 um, fast forward, I ended up getting the scholarship, so I'm very, very appreciative. Um, but the truth is, I'm looking at, this, at the copy of the book that we sent him to advance copy to read it, and it's got all these markups on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, some things never change, actually. <laughs> well, now it's just saying, I agree, yes, say more. <laughs> so let, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, first, just Tell the audience, what is this book about? What, what are the events that, you're, uh, that, that led you to write this book? Thanks. So, um, so the, the, the book is entitled Five Days. And, uh, and, and for those who don't know, there's really been two places that I've ever known and called home for my whole life. One is uh, up in the Bronx, where my mom moved us to live with my grandparents uh, when I was about six years old after my father died. And uh, my grandfather was a minister in the South Bronx. My grandmother was a school teacher in the South Bronx. And, uh, and I spent a good amount of my childhood there uh, because at the time after my, father, after my father died, my mother had a really difficult time with that transition. Um, the only other place that I've really known and ever called home was Baltimore, Maryland. All our Baltimoreans in the house. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a place uh, that, uh, that is, is incredibly special to me. I always say you can't understand me if you don't understand the story of Baltimore. Uh, but this book about five days really goes through five days in the life of Baltimore through the eyes of eight people. And the five days that I really covered down on was five days that were surrounding the, the uprising and the unrest that took place after the death of Freddie Gray, uh, uh, coming close to five years ago, uh, where a young man who's 25 years old made eye contact, eye contact with police uh, an hour after he, he was then arrested. An hour after he was arrested, he was in a coma. And a week after he was in a coma, he died. And it led to weeks of protests in Baltimore City, people demanding accountability to hear about what happened. Uh, and the five days that I cover was really part of that apex of both the protests and, and the unrest, um, and culminated in that, uh, in that fifth day, where, uh, and through the eyes of these eight people, where you had a, the baseball's first baseball game ever in the history of the sport was played where the Baltimore Orioles played the Chicago White Sox. And for the first time in baseball history, an official game was played, and the official attendance was zero. And the reason the official attendance was zero was because the city was still in the middle of a state of emergency, and no one was allowed to go into the stadium. And so with these eight people that I profile, in, um, and I, and I want to see that was five days through their eyes, one is, a, uh, one is a, a, a woman who lost her brother to police violence just two years earlier and who had been protesting. She was marching with the great family, but was also wondering at the same time, where was this when my brother was killed? Uh, I, 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 it was also, we have a, a public defender who actually moved from Oregon and grew up in poverty in Oregon 
and now became a public defender in the city of Baltimore, a juvenile public defender, and was defending children, uh, who many of them got caught up. A police major who grew up in West Baltimore and was now the police major in charge of the police force in West Baltimore, who was very clear when he said, none of my colleagues woke up that morning with homicide in their mind. But at the same time, I know exactly why these kids are angry. And so you want to see these, this, this, this time, this snapshot, through these eight sets of eyes that, uh, that I wanted also the readers to understand their perspectives, to understand there's a bigger story that we're trying to tell here too. So, and you told both stories. So well, and they, they told it so well. Let's get grounded for a moment in Freddie Gray, the actual human being and his life story. The book includes a timeline of Freddie's life before uh, this tragedy occurred, before he was killed. Um, and maybe just look at a couple of the highlight moments that you summarized to just ground us in, in his story. I, um, I, I wanted to include this because oftentimes I, th I felt like the conversation oftentimes got wrapped up in Freddie's death. But it's really important that people understand Freddie's life. And uh, I'll, I'll read you a small part. 1989, Gloria Darden gives birth to twins, a boy and a girl. The twins are born two months premature. In her early 20s, when she had the twins, Gloria never attended high school. She could not read nor write and struggled with heroin addiction. Tiny and underweight, Freddie and his twin sister, Frederica, spend their first months in the hospital. After five months, Gloria brings the twins back to the housing projects of West Baltimore. 1992. Freddie and his family moved to 1459 North Cary Street in West Baltimore. The home rents for $300 a month. In 2009, it and 480 homes just like it will be named in a civil lawsuit regarding the endemic levels of lead paint throughout those houses. By age two, Freddie and his twin sister have elevated levels of lead in their blood and suffer lasting brain damage. The family lives on North Cary Street until the twins are six years old. 1995, Freddie starts school at Matthew A. Henson Elementary School in Sandtown, Winchester. Because of the lead poisoning, Freddie's behavior poses considerable challenges to the school's teachers, statistically amongst the least experienced and worst equipped educators in Baltimore City. His teachers enrolled Freddie in special education classes, which he would never leave. By the fifth grade, Freddie was four grade levels behind in reading. Driven out of the classroom by his intellectual disability, Freddie spends his early years in nearby recreation centers. 2008, Baltimore City Public Schools records Freddie's last attendance in school. He's 18, he's in the 10th grade. 2009, Freddie's arrested and sentenced to four years in prison for, for two counts of drug possession with intent to distribute. 2011, Freddie's paroled and back on the streets. 2013, Freddie's arrested again for drug possession and distribution. Shortly thereafter, Freddie's half-brother, Raymond Lee Gordon, 31 years old, is gunned down near the Inner Harbor in downtown Baltimore. By April 12th, at 8.39 is when he has his first interaction with law enforcement. By 9.33, the medics arrive and provide patient care for Freddie for 21 minutes. By April 14th, Freddie undergoes double surgery at shock trauma. It is determined that Freddie has three broken vertebrae and an injured voice box. April 15th, he remains in a coma. April 19th at seven o'clock in the morning, Freddie is declared dead at shock trauma. The reason I wanted to clue, include the timeline is because if you look at Freddie's life, the reality is that week that he was in a coma might have been his most peaceful because he was surrounded by nurses and doctors. He was surrounded by people who knew his name, people who cared about whether he lived or died. The thing that we really want to say with this is we cannot just stop at mourning his death. His life needed to be mourned. Because when we're talking about a child who at two years old is born underweight, addicted to heroin and lead poisoned, and at this time, by the way, he's two years old, he never had a shot. And so when we have this conversation about people who are living in poverty, children who were born into poverty, and arguments about, well, if they would just work harder, how hard would Freddie have to have worked? And that's the point.
So this is a story that asks us to see the consequences of structural poverty and structural racism, and it's not just what the way he died, but how he lived. Um, and at the same time, it's also the fact that Freddie was an African-American male seen a certain way by uniformed authority and that he isn't the first that suffered this kind of violence. Um, so many people have in their own way said, I can't breathe, yes. who happen to be African-American living in our cities. Um, so how do you think about the story also in terms of um, tremendous discrimination and prejudice against men of color um, uh, and the, the way that being a man of color can be viewed as, by some, as a form of criminality just by existing? Where, where, where the, the, the sound of a police siren has a different pitch depending on what neighborhood you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just in, that, in that time period alone, in that, in that summer, in that year alone, The Guardian reported that uh, over 100 black men were killed uh, by police, uh, unarmed. Uh, and, and, the, and the thing about it is, is, do we have a very real issue with this in many communities? The answer is yes, and the truth is that's, that's just a Baltimore conversation. You know, Baltimore is one of, one of many cities that find themselves under a consent decree where it's the Department of Justice who did a report and indicated that there were improper and race-based practices when it came to how people were policing in certain neighborhoods. And, and when you look at other areas, particularly areas that are hyper-segregated and heavily impoverished, that's a reality yeah. for many places. You know, I, 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 think, I think about it in respects to, I think about it in respects to my own son, uh, who's six. And there is a certain reality that I know is that in the neighborhood that I live in in Baltimore, which is different than the neighborhood I grew up in, um, for the, if the behavior that took place in the neighborhood that I'm in now, if, if, the neighbor, if the, some of the behavior that was taking place, things that I saw coming up, was taking place in the neighborhood that I'm in now, before the officer could even make it back to the station, someone would meet them and say, you're badging your gun, yeah. right? So there is a difference. And the socioeconomic reality of that is there. Um, it's also important, though, to recognize, to recognize and remember the fact that this also is not just about socioeconomics. That when we're talking about these issues, race does matter. The data plays it out, the data shows it. And, and, and there are certain conversations I will have to have with my son that my neighbor will not have to have with his. And that is something that does sit with me as a father. And it's something that frankly, I think we have, that have, we have to remember that that should sit with us as a large society. I would love to be able to say we can have a race-free conversation about how we're going to address structural inequities inside of our society. The problem is the structural inequities were not race free. And so the way you have to dismantle something is you have to be honest about the things that help to enable it in the first place. One of my uh, former students, his name is Donnell Bailey, uh, grew up in New Orleans and then had to move to Houston with his grandmother and his mother after um, Katrina. And later he came back. He studied the history of his neighborhood, the history of the hospital where he was born, the history of um, uh, policing in New Orleans when he was in college, when I knew him. Uh, and he said to me, you know, I used to think I grew up in a poverty-stricken neighborhood, and now I know that I grew up in a poverty-structured neighborhood. Yes. You know, there is, it, it's, we, we, when we look at the realities of what we have in the existence within our size, we can't pretend like these things haven't happened very intentionally, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we talk about things and understanding context and history of, of things like blockbusting and discriminatory lending and discriminatory housing processes and redlining, not because it's interesting or it's like issue of the day, it's because that's the reality that many of our communities have to endure and have continued to have compounding impacts of. You know, and, and you realize that the power of policy in all of this. You know, one of the things that I'm so extraordinarily proud of, 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 of Robin Hood and so many of the organizations here for, th for thinking about having a, a, a policy lens into this work is policy matters. Yeah. We exist in a system of laws. And there are laws that are still currently in place that are either protecting 
many of our most vulnerable, or are actually continuing to make life harder on them. Just take, you know, if, if, you, if you take you know, a, a couple issues, think about the life of Freddie Gray. The fact that we have known that, neuro, that, that, that lead is a neurotoxin for a century in this country. And we still have children growing up in homes and attending schools that have lead-based uh, lead piping and lead-based lead paint. We've known it for a century. We've just chosen to pick and choose which ones became priorities to deal with. The CDC says that if you have five microbes of, of lead inside your blood, it essentially can make you, you know, it will suffer lasting brain damage. Five. Freddie Gray had 36. So these are policies. The fact that we need laws that will protect people and then laws that will enforce and reinforce the laws take place. The same thing with, you know, you look, you look at poverty right now. You know, we saw that the poverty rate, the adult poverty rate in New York City is, is, is hovers around 20%. If you, were, if, if, if you take away things like tax credits and transfers alone, that rate jumps to 31%. If you were to just enact any changes to tax credits and transfers alone, Policies matter. Yeah. And our ability to do our work means that we have policies that are reinforcing the ability to do the work rightly and correctly and for good. Yeah. There's some great sort of reflections in the end on your epilogue. And what does it all add up to? Um, and one of them I'd like to read that I, I just found so powerful was when um, you wrote, philanthropy can and should be catalytic. I proudly run what is by all measures one of the most quantifiably effective philanthropies in the country. But the truth is that our individual efforts are important but insufficient. Our collective action, the leaders we elect, the institutions administered in the name of the people, other stanchions at the table, offers an opportunity for bigger, longer lasting action. And I think that's so important that we remind ourselves that we both have to do everything we can as individuals. And we have to sort of surrender the notion of that we're gonna be the hero of the story and have collective impact together. Right. How do you think about that in your role leading Robinhood? I, I, I think about the fact that Robinhood is able to you know, be one of the largest funders of, of, of basic social services that are taking place in the city of New York. And I say that with an amazing deal of pride. Yeah. Like, we take a great deal of pride in the fact that we can, I can look amongst this crowd right here and look at all of you as our partners in the work. A deep sense of pride in that. I also know that the people in this room are not the reason that we have levels of poverty inside of this city, inside this country. That the people in this room, you're doing your part. You need help. You need help. Because for many of you, your organizations exist because you are covering up for another fundamental flaw. For all of you that are doing, whether it's after your, at your school programs, whether you are doing early childhood programs, whether you are doing job retraining and job reskilling programs, whether you're working on health issues, whether you're working on criminal justice reform, regardless of the thing that you are working on, part of the reason that you are working on it is because there is a flaw somewhere else in the system. And that's what makes you necessary. Dr. King has this quote that I, it actually sits on my desk, um, where it says, philanthropy is commendable, but the philanthropist can never forget the economic injustice that makes philanthropy necessary. It's economic injustice. And so when we think about this work, we think about what is the greatest power that we have. You know, our, our power is about our ability to make impactful grants, data-driven grants, work with the best social entrepreneurs throughout the city of New York and beyond. And the most powerful thing that we have is our voice. The most powerful thing we have is our advocacy. The most powerful thing we have is the ability to take data, take information, take content, and take human stories and turn them into meaningful and measurable actions. And I've been so impressed with the turn that you've made, the lean you've made towards using policy and data effectively in the recruitment of Jason Cohn, just one example of that. Right. That's, a, that's, a, that's a pivot for the organization a little. How would you describe that? Uh, imperative. Yeah. Imperative, and I, and I think it was time. I, I think the great thing is, is that for the organization, the organization was ready for this. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, a lot of people say, like, how did, how did Robin Hood think about that? Yeah. You know, what, did, what, did, what did the team say? What did the board say? And I said, you know, my answer was some of the greatest champions that we have of actually moving to the space was the board. Because we're trying to solve a problem here. 
And you're not going to be able to do it through the individual philanthropy and the grants alone. And so, you know, we will always be data driven. We will always be community led. Every issue that we take on will, be, will come from the community, not from white papers or an op ed. But it's things that the community and our community partners are telling us these are issues. Yeah. And we have a unique role to play. And we plan on being effective yeah. in everything that we do. Yeah. So I love the way the book elevates and brings together voices of people that lived those five days, cared deeply. Some were embedded in the problems and trying to change them from within. Some were suffered because of the problems. Um, some, all of them were trying to do their best yeah. in this circumstance. Their lives crossed in some interesting ways you'll see when you read the book. Yeah. There are beautiful layering of the history of Baltimore into it. So you learn the history without sort of having to read three chapters of set up, just marvelously written and constructed. And there were a lot of stories that- uh, That means a lot come from memory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of stories that I, you know, remember and I'm gonna be telling other people, uh, you know, because they, they, give us, they give us more to understand our reality. Uh, I'll close by asking you about a story you'd like to, say you'll remember for a long, long time. For me, one was when you had Freddie Gray's stepfather quoted oh, yeah. uh, at the end of a big, intense meeting of all these people, and he suddenly had to speak, and he basically said, all we've got is each other. And that, that really struck oh. me. Um, but was there a story you'd like to close this with to sort of invite our, our audience to get the book and to find meaning in it? I think the, the one story that, that really resonates with me is from a gentleman named Anthony Williams. Uh, and for those Baltimoreans, y'all might know who's the head of Shake and Bake, who was the head of Shake and Bake, which is a very popular Baltimore skating rink. I say I was, I, was uh, I, I, I first went to Shake and Bake when I was 13 years old. I was scraping my knees trying to impress girls. And, um, but there was this expression that Shake and Bake always had, it's, it's called Shake and Bake Saves Lives. Um, because Shake and Bake always was focused on creating a peaceful environment regardless of what was going on outside. And, um, and Monday was Freddie Gray's funeral in the morning. By Monday evening, Baltimore is in the middle of a state of emergency. And the National Guard were now being called into the city to regain control. And uh, Tuesday was supposed to be Anthony's day off. And he woke up that one morning and he was watching television and seeing everything that happened. Now they, they kept on running the reels of the buildings on fire and all this kind of stuff. And there, he was watching a reporter at seven o'clock in the morning who was reporting live in front of the CVS that was burned down. And in the background, he saw a little girl. He said she was no more than eight years old and she had work gloves on and she had a broom. And he said the broom was as tall as she was. And she was just sweeping. And Tuesday was supposed to be his day off. And he watched this little girl on television. And then he listened to Miss Gloria, who was calling him, telling how the night before, how all of his skaters actually created a human barricade in front of Shake and Bake when all the buildings around were being, were being, were being, uh, um, were being damaged. And they told him, they're like, you're not coming in here. And his Shake and Bake wasn't touched all night. And it was the one day of rest that he had, but he said, I can't rest today. That little girl's not resting. My boys didn't, re didn't rest last night. And he went into work. And, and the, the thing I always love what he said, he said, um, I'm not a politician, so I don't give speeches. He said, I don't have money, so I can't write checks. But I know how to skate. And he called a group of his other skaters together, and they went to the intersection of North and Pennsylvania and he had his car and he started blasting Marvin Gaye music. <laughs> What's going on? And him and the skaters started doing things on four wheels that most people can't do on two feet. <laughs> and he made people smile. And he's like, that's what I knew how to do. I know how to make people smile, that's my job. And the, th the reason that really resonates with me is that none of us are asked to do everything. We're just asked to do our part. We're asked to do what we can do. And that day, on Anthony's day off, he went to work and he did what he could do. And that is, I think, the most powerful thing that anyone, any of us can be asked to do.
Yeah. Just do your part. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing your part with this book and so much else. Uh, what a privilege to be together. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations.